Turn now to Job chapter 18. Job chapter 18. I'm going to read all of verses or chapters 18 and 19. 19 is a little bit long, but it's also the most famous part of the passage of Job, I think. This is God's word. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, How long will you hunt for words? Consider, and then we will speak. Why are we counted as cattle? Why are we stupid in your sight? You who tear yourself in your anger, shall the earth be forsaken for you, or the rock be removed out of its place? Indeed, the light of the wicked is put out, and the flame of his fire does not shine. The light is dark in his tent, and his lamp above him is put out. His strong steps are shortened, and his own schemes throw him down. For he is cast into a net by his own cast into a net by his own feet, and he walks on its mesh. A trap seizes him by the heel, a snare lays hold of him. A rope is hidden for him in the ground, a trap for him in the path. Terrors frighten him on every side and chase him at his heels. His strength is famished, and calamity is ready for his stumbling. It consumes the parts of his skin. The firstborn of death consumes his limbs. He is torn from the tent in which he trusted and is brought to the king of terrors. His tent dwells that which is none of his. Sulfur is scattered over his habitation. His roots dry up beneath and his branches wither above. His memory perishes from the earth and he has no name in the street. He is thrust from light into darkness and driven out of the world. He has no posterity or progeny among his people, and no survivor where he used to live. They of the west are appalled at his day, and horror seizes them of the east. Surely such are the dwellings of the unrighteous, such is the place of him who knows not God. And then Job answered and said, How long will you torment me and break me in pieces with words? These ten times you have cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed to wrong me? And even if it's true that I have erred, my error remains with, its, with myself. If indeed you magnify yourselves against me and make my disgrace an argument against me, know then that God has put me in the wrong and closed his net about me. Behold, I cry out violence, but I am not answered. I call for help, but there is no justice. He has walled up my way so that I cannot pass, and he has set darkness upon my paths. He has stripped me from, my, from me my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side, and I am gone. And my hope has he pulled up like a tree. He has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. His troops come on together. They have cast up their siege ramp against me and encamp around my tent. He has put my brothers far from me. And those who knew me are wholly estranged from me. My relatives have failed me. My close friends have forgotten me. The guests in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I have become a foreigner in their eyes. I call to my servant, but he gives me no answer. I must plead with him with, plead with him with my mouth for mercy. My breath is strange to my wife, and I'm a stench to the children of my own mother. Even young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate friends abhor me, and those whom I loved have turned against me. My bones stick to my skin, to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me, have mercy on me, O oh, you, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Why do you, like God, pursue me? Why are you not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. If you say how we will pursue him, and the root of the matter is found in him, be afraid of the sword, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. 
The Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we've now arrived at the, uh, the most famous passage, as I said, in the book of Job. Uh, and here, for the first time, perhaps we receive uh, a bit of hope. Uh, there, there's something good that is said, something that is, uh, that's true, that's inspiring, because it's, it's been a long road with uh, this guy and his friends. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the next chapter I was just reading this morning, uh, one of the commentaries I'm looking at, uh, the next in chapter 20 started off saying, why do we keep having to listen to these friends? Why do, what is the purpose of us having to over and over and over again hear the same thing, after, you know, one thing after another from uh, these people? And, uh, and uh, there are reasons for that. We'll talk about those some next week. But uh, for now, we have another speech that we have to get through. Because we can't get to the hope without fully seeing the disaster, right? We can't get to uh, the gospel without seeing the kind of trouble that we're in. And so we have Bildad's second speech here. Remember, we're in the second act of the book of Job. This is, uh, this is where we are bottoming out and then just about to be on the cusp of heading up towards uh, redemption, heading up towards something good that happens in this book. Well, Bill Dad comes at Joe, and uh, it's a little difficult to uh, uh, relate uh, one speech to the prior speech uh, because uh, they all sort of feed off of each other. Uh, but uh, but the, the friends are clearly frustrated with Joe because Joe keeps maintaining his innocence and Bildad finally just comes out and says, uh, you know what? You're going to hell. This is where you belong, Job. Uh, and he really gives us a picture in chapter 18 of a living hell. Because he says, Job, look, we're not stupid. You can't change the way the world works. This is just how it is. The rock isn't going to move just because you want it to move. We know what happens to the wicked, and we see that happening in you. One thing that happens to the wicked is the lights go out. It's lights out for the wicked, you know, and, and uh, uh, we talk about, um, you know, we often talk about somebody who's not too bright. Uh, you know, they're one bulb short of a Christmas tree, uh, one candle short of a, a menorah might be more appropriate for Job. Uh, you're the one who is, who is uh, unwise, Job. You're the foolish one, not us. And wicked people are made to be dumb. You've got no brains at all, they say in verses 5 through 7. In fact, you're so dumb that you get yourself trapped in verses 8 through 12. You get yourself into bad situations. Everything that's gone on is your fault. You've, you've fallen into this trap. You set a trap for yourself. And you fell right into it. You know, like the coyote and roadrunner. Coyotes always set in traps for the roadrunner. And um, probably the little kids don't get that reference. But, uh, but, uh, but they, uh, you know, the coyote's the one that always gets uh, blown up or knocked off the hill, the cliff, or a rock landing on it or something. This is what they're saying about Job. You set traps and you forget it's there and then you run right into it. And now you're trapped like an animal. Your heel got caught in the snare. And then the wicked are destroyed. Verses 13 and 14. Like an animal that's caught by hunters, you will be destroyed. And here in these couple of verses here, we're introduced to a terrifying figure. And this is, it, it, it's almost lost because it just sort of, you know, uh, uh, you don't see the background to what's being said here uh, right away, but we're being introduced here to the figure of death. Uh, in ancient religions of the area, death was personified. He was an actual deity and he, and he had a name. His name was Mot. 
Uh, Mot was the ruler of the Canaanite netherworld and, and of other uh, uh, worlds too in their uh, sort of mythology. There's several passages in Euphoric that mention that it refer explicitly to Mot sitting on his throne in the depths of the earth. Mot is this devourer. He's the one who waits to receive you after you die, and then he consumes you. And that is, Mot is the Hebrew word for death. So in verse 13, when he says, the firstborn of death, he's actually saying the firstborn of Mot. They're referring to not just death in the sense of dying, they're referring to death in the sense of this deity that comes and drags you down into the netherworlds. And in fact, verse 13 is better rendered uh, in the Hebrew that the firstborn of death eats you with both hands. He's a vicious, he's a killer, he's death. It's like the Grim Reaper in our own uh, uh, imagination. One of the ancient texts says, draw not nigh unto the divine moat, lest he make you like a lamb in his mouth, like, and like a kid in his jaws he be crushed. This moat comes after you, and you see all this language of tents and dwellings that is referred to uh, in these verses. Verse 14, he's torn from the tent in which he trusted. These are all referring to the body, the, the body of your tent. And so in verse 14, you're torn, he's torn, this wicked man is torn from the tent in which he trusted, and he's brought to the king of terrors. You could, you could also translate that the king of panic. That's who Mote is, that is who death is, that is, he is the one that everyone is afraid of, because once Mote has you, you become his, and you become consumed, and he eats you with both hands, and then you become forgotten in verses 15 through 19. There's no memory of you anymore. You're gone from light to darkness. You're driven out of the world. There's no children to inherit your estates or to carry on your name. Mot is the king of terrors. He's the last enemy. He's the one that the West hates and the East fears. And it's all you've got, Job. It's all you've got. And that's obvious because of what you've gone through, because you will not admit that you are already in his clutches. He has already grabbed onto you. He is already consuming your flesh. He is already pulling you down to be with him. Your ignorance of your sin has set a trap that you will not escape from. Your heel is in the bear trap, the claws, and you are destined for hell. Well then, that's a happy picture. Job uh, replies then to his friend, Bildad. And he says, basically, you're right. I am in hell. I'm in hell right now. I'm in the hell of you. You're the ones that are devouring me. You're breaking me into pieces. You are tormenting with me with your words. I'm well aware of my situation. I'm well aware of what's going on around me because it's happening to me. And if I've sinned, what is that to you? Why are you so interested? We talked about this some last week. Why do you care so much? But as long as you're accusing me, verse 6, he says, it's God who has put me in the wrong. It's God who has caught me in the net. He's the one that has put me in darkness. He's made me a nobody. He's the one that has forgotten me. I'm already receiving whatever it is you think I deserve. But I'm not in the hands of moat. I'm in the hands of God. And it's true, you know, if death, if moat were, were Job's problem, he would have God to call out to. But the whole issue here is that God is the one doing this to them, to him, and so he can only call out to God to rescue him. 
Now remember, of course, it's Satan that's causing this, the direct cause of this pain. And so we always sort of have that working in the background here. That he thinks it's God, but it's really Satan, even though God has allowed it and set the limits on it. Uh, it's, it's, it's really Satan who is the one who is uh, d- the direct cause of the pain. But Job doesn't know that, and so he's, uh, uh, he thinks that God is the one who is doing this to him. They don't really have a category for Satan. They do have a category for moats. They have a category for death. And I want you to remember moat because moat's going to come back later on in the book. So Job suffers, but insists that he's innocent. That God's just mad at him for some reason, a reason that he doesn't understand, something other, though, than some specific sin that he has committed. And you have to remember that application for us. Job is suffering due to no fault of his own. In fact, he is suffering because he is righteous. Not only is he not suffering for his sin, he is actually suffering for his righteousness. It's not that he's sinless. We don't want to make him sound like he's a perfect man. But remember, the Bible does call him blameless. He had integrity. He walked uprightly. He he performed sacrifices for himself and for his family. He was a God-fearing, God-honoring man. And he suffered. It's important to remember that for us, that not everyone who suffers is sinning and deserving of that suffering. Sometimes in our our theology, you know, we very quickly want to find the sin. We see things not going well for somebody and we start to go, well, what are they doing wrong? Maybe they're, you know, they're not living right. That's why that's why the, the, the suffering has come upon them. Because we have certain theological categories that we want to satisfy, and we sort of uh, pair everybody down into um, uh, uh, Jesus good, everybody else bad, bad things happen to them because they are bad and doing bad things. Sometimes there is sin, obviously. Sometimes there are direct consequences of sin. But we can't limit the negative, con- negative human ex- uh, limit every negative human experience to everything being the result of sin. We do sin, and we are sinned against. Our sin is our fault, but the sin against us is not our fault. That is to say, that the sin against us is not our sin. It is someone else's, or it's just the devil tormenting us. Job has very fuzzy categories about all of this, by the way. But what he does know is that he continues to call for help. He continues to want justice for the crimes that have been done against him, but all he hears is silence. And we've seen this over and over again in the last several chapters where, uh, where Job is calling out for a witness. He's calling out for an advocate. But all he gets back is silence. He's not hearing voices. He's not getting relief. Everybody is turned against him. Everybody's walked away from him. Everybody is, the only people paying attention to him are breaking him in pieces with their words. And so now we're back to last week. We talked about the loneliness of Job. And here we have that same loneliness expressed to us, but in terms of his inability to get justice. When there's no one who will listen, where can you get justice? Verses 13 through 19, he laments this. My brothers, my relatives, my friends, my guests, my servants, my wife, Kids in the street, people I love, they all treat me like a stranger. They all hate me. They run from me. They don't listen to me. They've they've turned their back on me. But could I at least get some mercy from you, my friends? God has struck me. And whatever the reason for your punishment of me, why can't you be satisfied that this is enough? 
Haven't I paid whatever debt I owed? Not that I owed you anything. Where will I find justice? How do I get this? How do I get out of this? And so he resigns himself to the only thing that he can think of. Well, I have, I'm going to get justice in the future. Justice isn't coming now. Justice isn't going to come to me. It's got to come sometime in the future. But if justice has to come in the future, then the future needs to know about it. How do I communicate something to the future? How do I get the message so that it will last? And he says, so give me an iron pen. Give me something that I can engrave with. Give me some lead that I can melt into the carvings. I have to write this down. Get me a rock that I can carve these words into. So that I can get some justice. I need stone. I need something that lasts. And this is what we want, isn't it? Right? This is, this is something we desire. We see justice delayed and justice denied all the time. And it's not wrong to want justice. Justice is not a bad thing. It's in our bones. It's in our DNA. It's actually, you know, you know one of the hard things about the friends is that they're so close to being right. Justice was the way the world was supposed to work. Adam was supposed to obey, and then justice was supposed to be served in that he got life and blessedness and happiness forever. But he didn't. And now justice can only destroy mankind. Man needed grace now. And grace is the thing that the friends are missing, as I've mentioned a number of times before. God's world, but God's word, world still works by means of justice. But it has to be justice for someone who could bear it on behalf of all those who could not. Job is one of us. One of those like us who cannot bear it, and he needs someone to bear it on his behalf. He needs justice done for him, and there's only one person he can do that. He doesn't know everything, but he does know one thing. But this advocate, this witness, this one that he's been crying out for, for the last several chapters, this one that I've been crying out for uh, to vindicate me, the one who I've been begging to, uh, who can argue my case as a man, but has the same status and authority of God. He's not moat. He's not death. He's not someone waiting to snuff me out, to eat me with both hands, to make me an unfortunate forgotten man. He's not the firstborn of the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's my redeemer. And he lives. In fact, he's life himself. And there will come a day when he stands. And this is why I've got to get this word written down for him. There's a, there will come a day when he stands on the dust of the earth with his human feet. And though that day is going to come long after my skin has decayed, somehow I'll see him with my own eyes. In my own body, I'm going to see this man somehow. And yet when I see this man, I'm going to see God. And I'm dying to see him. How does Job know all this? <laughs> he suddenly bursts out with this incredible vision of Christ. How does he know all this? Well, he, he's some sort of supernatural revelation he's been given. Uh, we don't know, but he's been given insight that others did not have. And he joins those uh, people that we read about in Hebrews who uh, uh, saw these things and greeted them from a distance. Those who died in faith, not receiving what was promised then, but having to wait till we could see it too, so that we could all be God's people together. Where do you go when you can't find justice? You go to your Redeemer, your Vindicator, the one who rescues you from slavery, avenges your sin, by take, uh, again, avenges your sin against him by taking into his own body the wrath that you deserve. And he is the one who avenges sin against you. The 
says in Isaiah 35, saying to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not, behold your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is what the Redeemer came to bring. Notice then the final words of Job in his speech in verses 28 and 29. Where he says, if you say, how will we pursue him? And the root of the matter is found in him. Be afraid of the sword, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. Most commentators see this as being words against Job. Uh, uh, in other words, when it says in 28, how will we pursue him? They mean, how will we pursue Job? And the root of the matter is found in Job. But that'd be really weird for Job to speak like that when he's been speaking directly to them. So this is his friends being unsatisfied with Job's flesh, going after the flesh of his redeemer of which he just spoke. We've done all we can against Job, this innocent sufferer. Let's go after this redeemer who's really upsetting the way the world is supposed to work. He's the one that's at the bottom of all of this. He's the one that's at the root of all of this. And how dare that guy vindicate Job? How dare he restore Job's wicked flesh? We're supposed to get what we deserve. And yet this so-called redeemer is going to keep people from getting their just desserts. May it never be. Here we find more dimensions of the true nature of the friends. They despise the innocent. They despise grace. They don't have a grasp on the hideousness of their own sin, so they lash out at one who claims innocence. The only person that they could hate more than this sorrowful man in front of them is the man of sorrows himself, the Redeemer who was to come. And Job tells them here at the end, watch out. As much as Job has lamented his pain and his loneliness, feeling the burden of God's wrath, he was feeling that pain and loneliness because he was guiltless, because he was blameless. He was, in fact, pointing us to the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, who stood silent before his shears while they all, not only stripped him of his coat, but of his life. And Job says, watch out. one who indeed was delivered over to the king of terrors and thrown into the hands of moat while, a, while the crowd of friends in the ground at the foot of the cross cried out crucified. They cried out, this is what happens to the wicked. They cried out, this man could not possibly be innocent. Look at him hanging there. Job says, watch out. The friends of Job are the crowd crying crucified. They look upon the dying one and say, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Watch his roots dry up beneath and his branches wither from above. Watch the light of the world go out and his flame be extinguished. Watch his heel be caught in a trap that he laid for himself. Watch this single childless man die and be torn from the earth, torn from his body, torn in the wrath of God. This couldn't possibly be the son of God. And Job says, watch out, be afraid of the sword. Wrath brings the punishment of the sword that you may know there is 
a judgment. There's a judgment coming for those who speak like this in their hatred of God. Indeed, their friends had hit upon something. They were right about something. Chapter 18, verse 20. They of the West are appalled at his day, and horror seizes them of the East, because like lightning that comes from the East and shines as far as the West, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And he will come in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. When they accuse Job, they don't know who they're really accusing. But we must watch out still more today. Because what Job saw entirely in the future, we have already begun to say, to see. In fact, the stage has been set for his return. The Redeemer does, in fact, live. And the Redeemer, in fact, has set his feet upon the dust of this earth. And when the people of that day saw Jesus, the Redeemer, the man with human feet, they saw a very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. They saw the one who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and suffered and died and was buried. And it seemed like the light of the world had gone out and he, that he was trapped behind that rock, destroyed by moat, destroyed by death, and forgotten to all but a few who would soon be dead. If the earth could not hold him, the earth would be left behind, the tomb forsaken. Moat was not strong enough. And just as Moat got out his fork and knife to eat him with both hands, Jesus got up from that stone table and he turned the world of Job's friends on its head. And he did something that no one under their own power had ever been able to do. And in fact, the rock was removed out of its place. And once again, he stood on the dust of the earth. And on that day, your Redeemer lived, and he lives forevermore. On that day, he was vindicated by his Father who saw his righteousness, and he raised him for your justification. On that day, death was made a fool. Mock was mocked. On that day, justice for what you had done was done. And on that day, justice for what had been done to you is guaranteed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that due to no action of our own, due to no desert of our own, due to no uh, uh, goodness of our own, yet you have rescued us from the hands of death by sending Christ right into his clutches. Lord, we pray that we would be forever grateful for the salvation you've given to us, for the life you have given to us, that we would not fear man nor devil, nor even ourselves, that we would not fear death, but that we would keep our eyes upon you as we make our way to glory. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.